Welcome to The Savvy Investor, where it's our job to help you be secure in any economy. You know, there's lots of little retirement lies out there, and they all sound like common sense planning. But are they? Stick around for this informative show. Welcome to The Savvy Investor. You can have financial security in any economy. Today is the day you can take control of your financial future and eliminate worry about your retirement forever. Each week, The Savvy Investor helps viewers just like you create and grow wealth, protect and preserve it, and distribute it in the most tax-efficient manner. And now, The Savvy Investor with your host, Michael Connett. All those talking heads out there, from the radio shows to print media and advertisement on television, they're all telling us these little white lies. And for us, it's really important that you truly understand how money works and how these little white lies impact you. Before we go into the seven retirement lies that I'm going to share with you today, we want to take a look at the news like we do every week here on The Savvy Investor. So first up, uh, from Allianz, a big insurance company, one of the biggest insurance companies out there, um, they did a, a study here on retirement, and, and, and I want to read these things to you because it's some really interesting facts. And what they came up here with is that um, people age 55 to 65, 10 years away from retirement, they report they are unsure of how much money they're going to need during their retirement years. That means they haven't even begun to think about how much money is it going to take for me to retire in a comfortable manner? And that's 10 years from retirement. Now, this, this survey goes on, this report goes on to say that uh, over 40% of them have no realistic idea of what it actually costs to retire, and they have no realistic idea of how much they need to save, which is very, very scary, considering they have less than 10 years to retirement. And, and I thought this was really interesting, that 43% of them say they're not even going to focus on retirement income planning. They're not even going to think about it until they're within three years of retirement. And almost 16% say they're not even going to start until they're less than a year away. So think about this. They're planning for 30 years of their life in six months' time. That is just absolutely crazy. Now, that's from Allianz. Now, uh, another, another article that I just saw here, it's, uh, it's from her book, uh, Susie Orman, and I've said it over and over uh, time again, she drives me crazy. I mean, she's a horrible driver. We've seen that on the, the commercials. But she does have some interesting things to say. And from her book, The Road to Wealth, she says here, um, if you do not want to take any risk but still want to play in the stock market, a good index annuity might be right for you. And the reason why she says this is that Annuities can be conservatively accumulated assets to help cover fixed living expenses in retirement and have successfully protected the life savings of many Americans. So what she's talking about here is that conservative investments, that's what I want us to focus on. She's talking about using conservative investments for retirement planning. And finally, Ed Slot, probably the nation's retirement expert, certainly IRA, expert, IRA experts, you've seen him on PBS and shows like that. And what he says here is that you have a silent partner in your IRA. You have a silent partner with the IRS. And he tells this really great story in his book, The Retirement Savings Time Bomb. I was reading through it just recently. And he's got this great story in there about this man. He inherited money from his father. And when he inherited money from his father, by the time he got paid, done paying income tax, estate taxes, and the stinky little sneaky tax called excise tax, he was going to have to pay 103% in taxes. And he took it to court. And fortunately for him, he was able to find a sympathetic judge that told the IRS, you're not allowed to take more than 100% of anybody's money. You can't take more than 100% out of anybody's IRA for tax purposes. So the good news is he didn't have to pay 100, 103%. The bad news is the court did let the IRS take 100% of the IRA. So the point here is that you have a sneaky little silent partner in the IRS in your IRAs and your retirement accounts. Now, we're going to sit down and we're going to have a conversation about those retirement lies out there. And from my perspective, there's seven of them. And they're very scary. Stick around and we're going to reveal them to you as soon as we get back.
Welcome back to The Savvy Investor. Today we're going to talk about seven retirement lies that are being told to us by those big financial institutions and those talking heads. Now the fact is, those things benefit them and they do not benefit you. They don't benefit us. It's all about them. So let's dive in to these seven retirement lies. And I want to start out with number one. And to me, this is probably the biggest fallacy out there. And it's called the 4% rule. And you probably heard this over your life. Uh, lots of advisors adhere to the thought that you can have a balanced portfolio. And when you have a balanced portfolio, let's say 50% equities and 50% bonds, just for, for simplicity's sake, that if you have a balanced portfolio, that you can take out about 4% per year. So for example, if you have $100,000 in your portfolio, and it's half stocks and half bonds, every year you would withdraw $4,000 from it. Now, here's the problem with that philosophy. In the 90s, that worked extremely well. And if you think about it, the stock market was up 10 and 20% every year, and so that making a 4% withdrawal never impacted you because 4% after you got a 10 or 20 percent return, you had more money at the end of the year than you did at the beginning of the year. So clearly, 4 percent withdrawals in an upward market works extremely well. But what happened over the last decade? How has that worked out over the last decade? And, and think about this. In 2000, let's say you retired in 2000, the stock market was down 20 percent. So if the stock market's down 20 percent and you had to take out four, because you wanted your 4000 all of a sudden, you have 24% less money at the end of the year. You're down to 76000 from your 100000 Now, next year, 2001, the stock market was down 25%. And you still wanted to take your 4% out. So now, we've, we're down 29% that year. And the following year, 2003, think about it this way. Excuse me, 2002, the stock market was down another 20%. So at the end of three years, you are down over 75% from where you started. And if you think about it, I wrote out some numbers here because it's kind of interesting. The, the fact is, is that at the end of the first year, when, when the market was down that 20% and you took out 4%, in order to create the same $4,000, you actually had to take out 5.3% the next year. So when the market was down 25%, you were down a little over 30 with your withdrawals. And as a matter of fact, by the time you got to 2001, uh, 2002, you had to take out over 7.5%. And 2003, you had to take out 10%. And, and I just want to show you some math here on how this works. So if we bring this up, let's say, for example, at the end of the first year, you had $76,000 left, right? Because you started with 100, you lost 20%, which is 20,000, you took 4,000 out, so now you're at 24,000, uh, 24, so that gives you 76,000. So 76,000, and this is where, you know, Mrs. McCarthy really paid off for math for me. Um, $76,000 is what you have, and you're trying to get $4,000. Well, you have to divide both sides by 76,000. So 4,000 divided by 76,000 equals 5.5. To six percent. So think about that. By the time you got to 2003, you had to take 10 percent out and you're running out of money. So the question I have for you is, if you think about it from this perspective, 90s it worked really well. So in an up market we know it works really well. The last decade has been sideways at best, up down sideways. It hasn't worked out so well over the last decade and we've already shown you that if you retired in 2000 you'd be running out of money today if not already out. So does the 4% rule really work in a down or sideways market? And I don't think it does. I don't think that's probably the direction you want to go. Now, think about this. Those big institutions still have all over their websites take out 4%. So I think that's one of the biggest fallacies out there. Now, line number two, have a balanced portfolio. And I know what you're thinking. Didn't you just tell me a balanced portfolio didn't work? Well. This is a different example of what a balanced portfolio means. Now, you've probably heard of Putnam Mutual Fund Company, one of the largest mutual fund companies out there. And they did a study about two years ago. And it's an interesting study because what they came up with is they said, look, as you enter into retirement, you should have no more than 25% of your assets that are designed for income, that you're going to be using for income purposes, no more than 25% 
in the stock market. Now think about this. This is a mutual fund company that makes money selling you mutual funds and they're telling you not to put more than 25% into the stock market. And as a matter of fact, when you read the whole article, it goes on to talk about the fact that by the time you get to be 75 and 80, 5%. 5% should be in the market. And for those of you working with an advisor, or even doing it yourself, I bet, I just bet, if you have stock market exposure, it's a heck of a lot more than 5% and probably more than 25%. So there's lie number two. Now moving on, I want to go into lie number three. And that lie is that IRA assets, that the IRA is a great tool to accumulate assets and have assets into retirement. And when I'm talking about IRAs, I'm really talking about all those retirement accounts. 401ks, 403bs, 457s, the TSPs, any of those employer-sponsored plans. That's what we're talking about when we use the words IRA in today's show. Now, here's the problem. All through your working years, the government and your employer gave you all these incentives, all this encouragement to put money into these retirement accounts. And they grew and they grew and they grew and you didn't pay tax on them, which is wonderful, absolutely wonderful. The problem is, and this is what Ed Slott was talking about, is by the time you get to retirement, you are forced to take money out of your IRA. Now, this is the only asset out there, the only investment class out there that forces you to take money. And you're taking money out of this because you're forced to at your highest marginal tax rates. Again, because you're forced to take money out. Now, great for accumulating money, horrible for income distribution because of that tax partner you have in the IRS. Now, we've covered three. We have four more to go when we come back. We're going to take a quick break. Stick around. We're going to discover the last four retirement lies they are telling us. You're watching Mike Kinnett on The Savvy Investor, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to The Savvy Investor. I'm your host, Michael Kinnett. Today we're talking about those little lies that investment companies, that talking heads in the media, on the websites, those things, the seven lies they're telling us. Now, we've shared with you three. We have four more to go. Before we go there, I want to go to viewer mail like we do each and every week right here on The Savvy Investor. Now, we recognize retirement planning is daunting. It's nerve-wracking. It's scary at best. Email us here at The Savvy Investor. We respond to each and every email that comes in. Every week we put a couple here up on the show to share with our viewers when they're applicable to our conversation of the day. So the emails we got uh, this week that I really liked, one of them is from Nancy out here in Nottingham, Maryland. And Nancy's talking about, um, she went to retirement seminar and, and the presenter talked about uh, that to produce a reliable income stream during retirement, she should use a portfolio of dividend paying stocks, preferred stocks and bonds. And I would tell you, Nancy, that that is a kind of a traditional approach to creating income during retirement. And, and to some extent, I get why your advisor would make that recommendation, or I guess the, the seminar presenter made that recommendation, because it's, it's old-fashioned, it's true, it's blue, it's, it's been tried, and, and it seems to be reliable. And what I would tell you, Nancy, is that probably all the way up to, I don't know, maybe 2008, I would have understood it. Because dividend paying stocks, very nice, every year they pay a consistent dividend. Preferred stocks, every year they pay a preferred dividend. Bonds pay interest every year. And that seems very comfortable. You can produce a nice, reliable income stream. But in 2008, what happened? Not only did the stock market crash, bonds went down in value, but dividend paying stocks suspended their dividends. Preferred paying stocks suspended their dividends. Even bonds stopped paying interest. And that stopped in 2008. Most of 2009, it was just towards the end of 2009 that dividends started coming back and interest payments started coming back again. And so if you're going into retirement, you certainly can't afford to have your income stream cut in half or in two thirds. And so I'm not sure that I agree with that advisor that if you want a safe, reliable, predictable income stream, that using the old-fashioned, traditional approach 
really makes sense. Now, I happen to believe, and this is my philosophy, I happen to believe that the next seven to 10 years are gonna look a lot like the last seven to 10 years. And if you think the next seven to 10 years are gonna be difficult, we may see more events where we see suspended dividends and, and, and uh, uh, bond funds and bonds stop paying interest. That is catastrophic to a retirement plan. Now, if you happen to believe that the stock market is going to get better and it'll start to resemble the 80s and 90s stock market, then certainly that approach could work. But that's my caveat for you, Nancy. Now, uh, Don from Atlanta uh, asks us, he asks this question about, he's watching my show. Thank you, Don. I appreciate you watching our show. And uh, an advisor told him that, that uh, using a, an annuity with a living benefit rider is the way to create income during retirement and that his advisor said that annuities are a horrible investment. Well, you know, Don, I hate to put it this way. Your, your, your advisor is probably right. Annuities are a horrible investment. But from my perspective, annuities aren't an investment vehicle, but that's not what they're designed to be used for. And like any tool out there, and we say that this every week here on the Savvy Investor, there is the right tool for the right reason and the wrong tool for the wrong reason. So when annuities are used correctly, they can be a fantastic tool. And think about it, that's true of any tool. If you use the tool correctly for the purpose for which it was designed to be used, it can help accomplish your goals. And from my perspective, and here uh, uh, at The Savvy Investor, we think that annuities are good primarily for producing steady, reliable income streams. Now, your advisor can, can disagree, and I'm okay with that. There's more than one ways to approach it. We just talked to Nancy about using preferred stocks and such to produce an income stream. What I would ask your advisor, if I was you, is to sit down, create a plan for me in writing, and show me how you're going to create a guaranteed retirement income stream for me, and if you're married, your spouse. And if he can show you a guaranteed way to do it, well, then that's a viable option. But if you're looking for the, the safety that annuities produce, that provide to you, you know, if you want those guarantees like bank guarantees with FDIC or insurance with insurance you know, companies that guarantees or even the federal government with how they guarantee their money, there's a sense of security and sleep at night when you do it that way. Certainly you can take the more traditional approach, but from my perspective, why take the risk if you don't need to? I would have that conversation with your advisor, Don. Thank you very much, we appreciate it. And Don, we appreciate you uh, watching the show. Um, so let's go back now. I wanna get back to the seven, the seven lies. We've talked about the first three. We talked about the 4% withdrawal. We talked about a balanced portfolio. We talked about IRAs and the silent partner you have in the, I, in the IRS. And I didn't really mention this, so I wanna go back to that for just a minute. Remember now, you have to take money out of your IRA every year. And failure to take money out of that IRA is a 50% penalty for goofing that up. So you think about that, 50% penalty for goofing it up. And I just wanted to throw that out there. Plus, if you're not careful, it makes your, tax, uh, your Social Security taxable. So there's a bunch of problems with having money in IRAs and better solutions to that problem down the road. Now, number four, let's go to number four here. Annuities are bad. Well, that's on my list. Unfortunately, Don asked us that question. And same thing I just said to Don. The fact is, is that annuities aren't good. They're not bad. Annuities, well, they just are. It's like saying mutual funds are good or mutual funds are bad or stocks are good or bad. They're not good or bad. They are the right tool for the right reason. If they are used the way they're designed to be used, they can be a good tool. The problem is that there's people out there that think it's one size fits all and an annuity is a solution for everybody. Well, that's just not true. Annuity is designed for very specific purposes, and if you use it correctly, it can be the right tool for you. Certainly, you wouldn't put all your money into it, but a portion of your money that you want to use to produce income might make sense. Line number five, you don't need life insurance. Now, I, I kind of chuckle at that because to some extent, it almost makes sense. If you think about it, I don't have a family I have to take care of anymore. Uh, hopefully, I don't have a big estate tax bill that I have to deal with. And I'm not trying to make somebody rich, so what the heck do I need life insurance for? I mean, common sense says that makes sense, that works. But here's the deal. Are you more likely to die after age 65 or before 65? That's right, after 65. And insurance companies know this. They want you, they want you to pay premiums for all those years up to the point when you retire 
because they're pretty sure they're never going to have to pay. Well, there's only a couple things that are certain, death and taxes. So imagine if you had a life insurance policy, because you know you're going to die, somebody is going to get tax-free money. And you know, I know tax-free, it's kind of like that catnip for Americans, but the fact is, is that tax-free money is a wonderful financial security tool. So I think that retirees miss the boat when they assume that they don't need life insurance. Now let's move on to lie number six. Your money has to be liquid. So the question I have about that, my money has to be liquid. Hmm, why? Why does your money need to be liquid? You've saved all your life for retirement. You're gonna be taking this income. Why do you need money liquid? I hear all the time, well, I might wanna buy a house. Really? You're gonna take out two or $300,000 to buy a second home? What's the tax rate on that two or $300,000? You're going to lose $60,000, $70,000, $80,000 in taxes because you want to buy a home? When was the last time you took two or $300,000 out of an account? Even if you wanted to buy a car, in today's low interest rate environments, it makes better sense to finance it than pay that huge tax bill. And keep in mind, this money is designed for income. You saved your whole life to use this money as income during retirement. It was never designed that I just want to take this big chunk of money and, and go do something with it. So having all your money liquid is a fallacy. The money should be designed in such a way to produce the income that you need it to produce. And here's the deal. There's a trade-off for liquidity. You're going to give up safety and or growth. And the fact is, is that there really isn't an opportunity or a reason to take a big, huge lump sum and spend it all at once. Now that was number six. Let's look at lie number seven. And to me, I think this is the most important lie out there, the, the, the one that is, is foisted upon us more than any other lie. And that's the lie that says that you should be working with the same advisor that helped grow the money. There was a great article from Smart Money uh, about, about a year ago that came out and said that, listen, uh, I, I want to I get this correct here on, on reading it. So there's a great article from Smart Money Magazine that says planning for retirement is child's play in comparison to planning for income after retirement. You think about it. You have a fundamental shift in your life at this point. You've gone into retirement. And the person that helped you accumulate the wealth probably is not the person that helps you distribute it and protect it during retirement. And think about it. It is a fundamental change in your life. The skill set that's required to help you grow money is completely different than the skill set that's needed to help protect and preserve it and distribute it. And just make the comparison to a doctor. When you were young, you had a pediatrician. Did a wonderful job helping you get into young adulthood. And that pediatrician had very specific skills, very specific knowledge that helped you when you were younger. Well, now you're an adult and you're getting into retirement age. Do you want your pediatrician making health decisions for you now? Now, absolutely not. You want somebody who is skilled in your particular issues at this particular point in your life. And that's what a retirement specialist does. Somebody who truly understands the tax implications, how to protect and preserve the assets so that they survive you and survive your spouse. Because after all, that's the whole point of getting into retirement so that it's there for you and your spouse. Now we're gonna take a quick break. When we come back, we're gonna wrap up with the seven lies that they are telling us. You're watching The Savvy Investor with Mike Kinnett. I'll be right back.
Now keep in mind that just like any tool, there's the right tool for the right job and a wrong tool for the wrong job. We have just scratched the surface here, and you'll want to know more about how today's conversation might or might not fit your needs. Ask about fees, surrender charges, market risk, interest rate risks, how the guarantees work, liquidity, and much more. Remember, the right tool for the right job. Welcome back to The Savvy Investor. On today's show, we talked about those seven retirement lies that those institutions and talking heads have been telling us. We talked about the, the fallacy of a balanced portfolio. We talked about being able to take 4% out of your portfolio every year. We talked about annuities and liquidity, and we talked about IRAs. And, and finally, we wrapped up the show talking about who the right advisor is during those retirement years. We have a great paper that we wrote on this. It's a nice brochure explaining the seven retirement lies. If you'd like a copy, give us a call and we will get you out the details of these lies that you're being told each and every day. Now, next week on The Savvy Investor, we're going to be talking about creating your own private pension plan. And this is important because in today's economic times, we can't rely on anybody else but ourselves during retirement. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next week. If you'd like more information about today's show, you can contact our offices with our toll-free number, 866-597-1040, or visit us on the web at www.thesavvyinvestortv.com. When you visit our website, sign up for our free weekly newsletter where we give you tidbits each week to help you make smart money choices. Every retiree's goal, from our perspective, is to take the least amount of risk possible to accomplish your goals. Too often, financial advisors and stockbrokers assess your risk tolerance just because you can tolerate the risk doesn't mean you have to accept it. Remember, at the end of the day, it isn't how much you make, it's how much you keep.